Each quarter, the Longefest, an endeavour spurred out of Fetidal, showcases pre-print research publications to spotlight the most groundbreaking longevity studies each quarter. The papers are selected by their editorial team, with their Longefest creators then selecting their top three favourites. In this video, we'll take a look at the key findings from each of the top three papers of this quarter, taking us from reproductive ageing to sleep health and senescence to how to best conduct lifespan studies. Have we been doing it all wrong? First up is this preprint, Exceptional Longevity of Mammalian, Ovarian and Oocyte Macromolecules Throughout the Reproductive Lifespan. This study looked at long-lived proteins. Most proteins, once created, chill within the cell for some hours through to a few days before they get degraded. However, a subset of proteins persist for much longer, so-called long-lived proteins. Typically, they are found in post-replicative tissues like the heart and brain, and the proteins typically provide structural support to maintain important protein complexes. Now, other cells that persist in a dormant state for a long time are oocytes, the female reproductive cells. These long-lived cells remain in the ovary arrested in cell cycle until ovulation, occurring between puberty and menopause, so many years. And the oocytes are also interesting to consider when considering long-lived proteins, because the maternal proteins in the fertilised egg come from the oocytes. And secondly, the oocytes are packed full of mitochondria, with many long-lived proteins being mitochondrial. It therefore serves as an interesting and important topic worthy of discussion. So, this preprint describes approaches taken to define the long-lived proteome of the ovary and oocytes. The approach they took to identify the long-lived proteins was to create fully N15 labelled female pups by feeding them with N15 labelled foods. Must have been very expensive. But after that, they then chased the females for six months with normal food with N14. So, if you look at proteins in six months' time, long-lived proteins would still have N15. From their data, they found ZP3 at six months as an interesting protein, because this protein comprises the sona pellucida, the glycoprotein complex outside the ovary. Otherwise, they identified expected nuclear, cytoskeletal and mitochondrial proteins. They also pointed out that the fractional abundance of mitochondrial long-lived proteins in the brain and the heart is much lower than that observed in the ovary. But how does this all link back to fertility? Well, according to the researchers, it is possible that these long-lived molecules will accumulate more damage in primordial follicles that remain quiescent for longer periods relative to those that activate earlier. Whether such damage occurs and how it translates into decreased follicle survival or gamete quality will require further investigation. The second paper featured this quarter in the Longefist is Chronically Disrupted Sleep Induces Senescence in the Visceral Adipose Tissue of Black Six Mice. In this study, they sleep-deprived mice and found accumulation of senescent cells, particularly in the visceral adipose tissue compared to other tissues like the brain and liver. The sleep of middle-aged mice was disrupted for 30 days using an automated system, and following this disruption, the researchers found increased blood levels of interleukin-6 and signs of senescence, particularly as mentioned in the visceral adipose tissue. It would now be of interest to see what the consequences of these senescent cells are, and if senolytics are useful to tackle the sleep disruption many experience, whether it be from shift work, newborn care or chronic stress. And then the final paper of this quarter is the impact of short-lived controls on the interpretation of lifespan experiments and progress in jury science, which, as it states, is an analysis of how using short-lived strains of model organisms can make longevity interventions look better than they actually are. So in this study, they reanalyzed previously published studies and concluded that a putative mouse longevity intervention should only be considered with high confidence when control lifespans are close to 900 days or if the final lifespan of the treated group is considerably above 900 days. So by reanalyzing previously published datasets in this publication, they observed a negative correlation between lifespan extension and control lifespan. In other words, when researchers observed a greater lifespan extension, the control lifespan was much shorter. 
So looking forward from these observations, the researchers suggest that we should work with the longest lived mice, as exaggerated lifespan effects can be observed when working with shorter lived controls. They also argue that long lived strains are a more faithful model for human physiology and longevity, given the exceptionally long lifespans of humans compared to other animals. And therefore, this 900 day rule for mouse lifespan experiments and is sufficiently accurate to be useful to editors, reviewers, scientists, and lay readers alike. And I like this quote, based on a 900 day rule, we define treatments that extend the lifespan of short lived cohorts as longevity normalizing, whereas those that work in long lived cohorts are longevity extending. So there you have it. These are the three top preprints from this quarter from the Longevist. If you want to find out more or even join this vibrant community, and dive deep into the latest longevity science and play a pivotal role in shaping the future narrative of this fascinating field, you can find out more in the link I've pinned down below. So with that, I hope you've enjoyed this video and thank you for listening.